what's your secret to a happy marriage? Stand your ground. Ooh, get closer <laughs> to the mic. You got to say that, Grandma. <laughs> Just stand your ground. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Now more than ever, after so much uncertainty and change that came from the last year, I'm recognizing the universal truth that tomorrow is not promised. The last year also showed us that things that seem guaranteed, like being able to hold our loved one's hands and hear their voices, not through a telephone or Zoom microphone, are not always guaranteed. I feel so lucky to have three living grandparents, but the pandemic kept us apart. It was hard on all of us, and we knew it was necessary to keep everyone safe. But when the vaccines became a reality for my grandparents, we were so excited because it meant that finally, after a long year of no visits, no hugs, no stories shared around the table, we got to finally be together. Drew, Coco, and I had the opportunity to host all of my grandparents at our house for a little slumber party, and it was just so special seeing them and having us all be together. They've actually become friends through the years, and so it was a really fun time making memories together. I wanted to interview my grandparents for so many reasons. Their stories are just so special to me, and with my greater appreciation for time and how fleeting it is, I wanted to capture their stories and voices in a way that I can hold on to, in a way that I can share with our kids when they're old enough to listen. While I first thought the interview would be just for me and our family, I decided to share it with you. In fact, my grandparents were hopeful that I would share it with you. They are so supportive of this show and the podcast. I've described the podcast kind of like a radio show and a sermon mixed, mostly about business. But really, I just hope this conversation makes you smile. I hope it paints this picture of where I come from in a new way. And I hope more than anything, it inspires you to reach out to the ones you love and savor the moments you have together. I am so excited to introduce you to my grandparents, Sulo, Dolores, and Ron. Thanks to Issue for supporting Gold Digger. Create once and distribute everywhere. Everything is optimized to post on your website and social platforms. Get started with Issue today for free or sign up for a premium account and get 50% off at issue.com slash podcast and use the promo code Gold Digger. Start and grow your email list in 2021 with Flowdesk. Start a free 30-day trial, no credit card necessary, plus lock in at 50% off your monthly subscription when you fall in love at jennacutcher.com slash Flowdesk. That's jennacutcher.com slash F-L-O-D-E-S-K. I am so excited because I'm here with my grandparents today. So sitting next to me is... Grandpa Ron. Yep. And then who are you? I am Grandpa Sulo. Yep, and Grandma. And Grandma Dolores. And we are all spending some time together. So today I wanted to interview my grandparents and ask them some important questions. So first, Grandpa Sulo, tell me a little bit about your childhood. Well, I grew up on a farm. I was number 11 of 12 children. And we always had a busy household, a lot of music. My sister, Janie, and Elma would played the accordion or piano, and we had music. A lot of times, especially during holidays, we'd get her on the piano and sing, and uh, that was very interesting for us. Very Mm. good. I love that. Grandma, what was your childhood like? You had an interesting story. Well, it really wasn't interesting, but my mother died when I was five, and so... It was hard that way, but I was at five. I was so little, I didn't really realize the magnitude of it. And but as I grew up, my dad had a garage real close to where we had a tar paper house, and he would have me 
take a, a paintbrush with oil and then clean the pistons and the rings and then put them on cardboard. And then he was a really good mechanic. So he did a lot of mechanic stuff. And then later on, he welded stuff. And then in 1950, no, 40, 46, we moved from North Dakota to Minnesota. And so we really liked Minnesota. And we had a farm and we had to walk quite a ways to get to the school bus that went to school. But it was good, and we learned a lot, and we learned how to do with or without. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Grandpa, tell me a little bit about your childhood. So Sulo and Dolores are married, and they are my maternal grandparents. And then my grandpa Ron here is my paternal grandpa. Well, I grew up in the western part of uh, Duluth, uh, close to the hillside. I moved into the house that I grew up in at one year old, and... uh, we just had a lot of fun. Uh, my brothers and I and my friends, we used to go up on the hillside, and uh, there was a, a creek that came down through the little zoo. It was called Kingsbury Creek, and we used to go up there and swim in the summertime and dam it up and have – there was trout in the in the stream and just had a lot of fun. And I, I stayed in that home until I went in the Navy, and and that's where just about all I could say about that, really – but uh, I grew up with a bunch of boys in the neighborhood, and we had a baseball teams together and played football, and that. so we had a good time. Well, collectively, between my grandparents, they have nine children. So Sulo and Dolores have four children, and Grandpa Ron has five boys. So give some advice for any of the parents out there that are parenting little children. Do you have any good advice? Well, one of the best things you can do is uh, show a lot of love to your family and uh, keep them busy when they're in their teens. And uh, they always had some chores to do, and that was very important. They learn how to take care of themselves and help with the family chores. And uh, I remember during the Depression, we picked strawberries. And uh, first, when you plant the strawberries, the first year when they're June berries, you have to pick all the blossoms off so they make runners. And my brother was three and I was five. (laughs) And then when we picked berries, we got two cents a quart for picking. So that was during the Depression. You didn't make much money, but uh, everybody was in the same boat and that's how it was. Grandma, do you have any advice for raising children? Respect them, but also be firm and teach them how right from wrong and encourage and they are doing something that you're really proud of. Let them know. And we've had a lot of that because the kids were wonderful. Hmm. Grandpa, what about you? You survived with five boys, (laughs) including my father. (laughs) Tell us. (laughs) Well, the only thing I can say really is to be active with your children. I, uh, I always was active with my sons. I, I was in scouting with them and uh, all their sporting activities. My kids were all involved in sports, and I tried to go to as many games and meets and things like like that that I could through the years. Uh, A lot of times I wasn't able to go because of my job, but I tried to attend as many functions as I possibly could, you know, so that's about all I can say. And, I, you know, we praised the kids when they had good grades and that and probably – didn't praise them when they didn't have two good grades, but most of them had good grades in, in that. So uh, I was really proud of that. Well, it's a testament that all three of you are here together. And we were talking about it this morning, how amazing it is that my grandparents are friends because you have built a relationship over the years, sitting in many bleachers, road tripping to many sporting activities and band concerts and everything. And so I think a lot of people don't have such an amazing example of just having great leaders and friends in their grandparents. So we're very, very lucky there, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing, really. For all the years uh, we've been together, 68 years of marriage uh, is a true blessing. And uh, with my wife sitting here next to me, that's that's quite an accomplishment. (laughs) Can you tell us the story about how you approach to grandma to become your bride? (laughs) Well, I was stationed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a military police for the Atomic Energy, and uh, it was the 4th of July weekend when I asked my commanding officer if I could uh, get a few days off. I wanted to go back home. 
and I flipped a coin in western Nebraska. And uh, anyway, I had heard earlier that my bride to be <laughs> I didn't was that. visiting her grandparents in North Dakota. And I didn't know if she had gone home on the bus yet or not, but I took my chance. So I flipped a coin and it was that I would go to North Dakota. And then after I got all the way through Nebraska into South Dakota and then into North Dakota, then I didn't remember the name of the grandparents. So I called the Dr. Stokes that had delivered my wife when she was born. And he went, mentioned to me that it's got to be the Bolstead. I said, that's it. So then I had to drive around the country, find the Bolstead farm. And I found it. And then uh, I met her at the door. And that's how it started. And uh, we got married on July 16th of 1952. And there was a tornado that night. And there was a tornado that evening. And uh, anyway, here we are after all these years. And uh, we are so blessed. Grandma, what did you say to Grandpa when he told you that you were going to get married in a few days? No. <laughs> <laughs> and you were how old? 16, almost 17. But then anyhow, when he said, well, <clears throat> that we were going to go to Albuquerque, I had hardly been to Duluth, Minnesota. So from North Dakota to go to Albuquerque, I thought, well, that sounds pretty darn good. <laughs> well, then he asked my dad if he could marry me. And um, my dad said only if she finishes school. So anyhow, I, when we, we got married and I got my transcript, so I really got my graduation before my high school kids, students did. It was wonderful. Hmm. Grandpa, tell me a little bit about Grandma Pat and when you guys first met. Grandma Pat is spunky. She's funny. She's <laughs> sassy. Tell us a little bit about her. Well, how it all came about was that uh, I was working in a uh, garage in downtown Duluth. Uh, my cousin owned the garage, but we used to service... Uh, the telephone cars, the FBI, things like that. We used to service them and work on them. And, and uh, my wife-to-be at the time, her and her girlfriend used to come into where I was working, and her dad would pick her up from work and bring her to her house and, and to his daughter. And uh, I had gotten a date with uh, one other girl. I said, this is after I come out of the Navy. And so I had a date with her, and my when I dropped my wife off, I says, well, I'll see you. And she says, when? <laughs> and I says, well, be a Saturday night because Friday night I had a date with somebody else. <laughs> so, but after we had that date on uh, on a Saturday night, uh, we were uh, two some from that point on. Aww, so she's the best. That's interesting. Yeah, Grandma, tell us a little bit about your nursing career because you became a nurse a little bit later in life, and a lot of my listeners are women who are starting their careers or maybe thinking about transitioning into something new. So tell us about how you became a nurse. We'd been living in Colorado and Sola retired and we came back to Minnesota. And I thought one of us has to get all this house, but I always wanted to do something more with my life. And I happened to see uh, through the college that they were having a um, nurse for LPNs and RNs. And I told him, I said, I'm going to school. He said, go. <laughs> so I did. Didn't really know where I was, but I went to school and I took all the classes and did all the things and did the rotations at the hospital and saw what real life is like and uh, just opened my eyes and I felt like I was doing something good. And then we had to go at that particular time. It was before the computers and all that kind of stuff. It was real good. And you had to go to St. Paul to some university to take the tests. And so then I took my tests and I passed it. So then I was an LPN. And then when I went back to the hospital, they asked what floor I wanted and what shifts I wanted. So I worked on a neural floor and saw a lot of things and wonderful. And how long were you a nurse? 21 years. That's amazing. That's super cool. So I want to know what brings you the most joy? You all are very grateful people. And so when you go to bed at night, what are you thinking of when you're grateful? Grandpa? Well, I think the greatest thing is... Uh, the love for our family. We have such a close-knit family. We all care about each other, and we're so helpful to each other, which is a true blessing, and we have been very blessed to have good health. And still at this age, which Dolores is 85 and I'm 92, so that's quite an accomplishment. So 
from that standpoint, I say we, we have truly been blessed. Mm-hmm. What about you, Grandma? Ditto. <laughs> what do you think of Grandpa? You have How many grandkids do you have now? I have uh, 12 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. Isn't that crazy? But I'll tell you, I, I've got five sons, and I'm proud of every one of them. Mm-hmm. They've all had a nice life, and they've accomplished a lot of things in their lives. And the one thing I do miss is the fact that when my grandchildren, I used to try to go to as many events, sporting events as I possibly could, and I miss not having to go to them anymore. Yeah. I, I enjoyed uh, the track and things like that. And, and Jenna here had, was a diver, and I miss that. Yeah. And I miss all the sports that my grandchildren were involved in. Mm-hmm. Plus, my, my children, my boys themselves, out of the five sons, four of them were, were distance runners, and one of them was in the swimming. He was a diver also. Wow. And uh, so uh, that's the, the sporting events is what I really miss. Yeah. I mean, you guys, if we could add up all the hours you collectively sat at track meets just to watch a two minute race or or a, or a jump or diving in those humid pools, it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. And I think you I mean, I remember to even our band concerts, like we would save a whole row of seats because everyone would come. And I think that's really incredible. I don't think a lot of people get that experience. Talk to us a little bit, Grandma and Grandpa, about how you would have all of us grandkids and we would do kind of an adventure and then go school shopping together every year. (laughs) That was always fun. Well, one thing that's interesting is each year before school, we made sure that we took our kids and grandkids out shopping and then we'd have an educational weekend. We'd go somewhere either to Itasca State Park where the Mississippi begins or we'd, we would go to St. Paul, and, and there's some interesting history there. We would go to Brainerd and see the Paul Bunyan, <laughs> and uh, we would go to different areas. We went to Mackinac Island and had a nice weekend with our children and grandchildren, and that was always interesting. We would try and do that every year before school shopping and then make a nice weekend out of it. So that's yeah. what we did. Yeah. And Joel was with us, and we were school shopping, and... He said, Grandma, I said, what? He said, I want that tent. I said, well, what does that have to do with school shopping? He said, I don't know, I just want it. I said, okay, go get it. (laughs) (laughs) Grandpa, one of my favorite memories was all of our times at the cabin. And I feel like I can close my eyes and hear the Macarena playing and seeing us all lining up on the dock. Talk to us a little bit about the family cabin. That place is a special place. Well, I start going out at the cabin. It was on Spider Lake in Wisconsin, probably from the time that I was about four or five years old. And it became the family cabin. And uh, we all spent a lot of time out there, had good times. And uh, during the uh, 4th of July weekend, we'd all blow off fireworks. And and my one of my sons, Scott, he went and bought a bunch of fireworks, and we'd blow them off. Then the people across the lake would blow some of theirs off, and it was like a competition. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of fun doing that, but uh, I really enjoyed the cabin, and I know my wife and family enjoyed it also. I always think about how Grandma Pat, when she would have to go out to the outhouse, didn't she always wake you up to go out with her? (laughs) It's uh, (laughs) We had a regular outhouse, and uh, my wife didn't like being out in the dark and uh, <laughs> so she would wake me up and if I wasn't awake already and so but it was fun it's things that you remember for yes. all, forever you know Yes. And we would have a uh, grandma would always have a pan with water in it to rinse your sandy feet off before you went into the cabin there's a lot of good sweet memories at that place So I want to know, what have you learned lately? So I am a believer that you're never done learning, right? We're always students of life and learning things. Is there anything you've learned lately? Well, one of the greatest things we've learned is uh, to spend time with our grandchildren. It's a true blessing of having a close-knit family. That's really been remarkable for our family. We're all real close and uh, that just means a whole lot to us uh, as we get older. When mm-hmm. when our kids are small, we would take good care of them and make sure that they're going to be responsible citizens in life, which they are. 
they all have good jobs and beautiful homes and they're just doing great. So it's been a true blessing. Grandma, have you learned anything new about yourself or anything? Not really. (laughs) (laughs) You're always learning. (laughs) Yeah. I think my learning thing, I mean, there's nothing that, well, I mean, there's a lot of things I don't know, but I enjoy and appreciate the things I do know. And I'm grateful. And I think each time we're grateful for the, our family mm-hmm. and just really proud of them. Yeah. Grandpa, have you learned anything new lately? Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, after I lost my wife, we had a, a track phone and I let the time lapse on it. And my family said that I should have a phone with me all the time. All my brother sent me a, he had a, a, an older iPhone and he sent one to me. So meantime, I kept my landline while I was learning how to use the iPhone. And uh, so I've gotten a little bit better with the iPhone now. I still have the landline yet, but I might just keep that too. So, but uh, no, that's the part of it. And then when uh, uh, I got a computer, I used to be on it all the time. And then after a while, I got kind of was bored sitting in front of that screen all the time. So I kind of got away from the computer and, and I... I've never been one for talking on the telephone to begin with, and uh, so I, I don't use my iPhone as much as probably a lot of people do, but yeah. it's there if I need it. Yeah. You've gotten really good on the iPhone, I think, and I can even send Grandpa pictures and things. It's pretty great. Flowdesk was created by two female founders to solve the email challenges that the other platforms just couldn't solve. Flowdesk is a favorite among my students with over 4,500 gold diggers on the platform today. To start, grow, or refresh your email list strategy with gorgeous, customizable templates, sleek and easy to install forms, simple to set up audience segments and automated workflows, try Flowdesk. Use my link to lock in at half off your subscription. That's $19 a month for life at jennacutcher.com slash Flowdesk. Flowdesk is an easy to use, intuitive and beautiful solution to email marketing. You don't need to learn how to be a copywriter, graphic designer and website developer to start and grow your email list. Flowdesk includes beautifully designed templates, many with pre-written copy you can use and adapt for your own brand's voice. You can create forms and pop-ups for opt-ins even if you don't have a website yet. Plus, behind the scenes insights to track your progress and email success. You'll have unlimited everything. There's no subscription tier. It's all yours from day one. So you can learn, grow, implement, and market to your list for $19 a month. No limits, no lock templates, all of the features you need to grow and serve your email list. Your monthly subscription is $19 a month. If you sign up at jennacutcher.com slash flowdesk, that's jennacutcher.com slash F-L-O-D-E-S-K. You made an incredible piece of content and now it's time to post it on your website and share to Instagram and send to your contacts. But if posting your creation everywhere includes reformatting, resizing, redownloading and reuploading, well, then you need Issue. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials to magazines to flipbooks and brochures and more. Make it once and distribute it everywhere without reformatting. Your content is already optimized for engagement and ready to share. Issue also works seamlessly with tools you already use like Canva, Dropbox, and InDesign so you can convert static PDFs into Instagram stories, embeddable flipbooks, and other forms of digital content. If you offer an ebook or printable, this is a great way to repurpose that content. And you know, I love repurposing content. Get started with Issue today for free, or if you sign up for a premium account, you will get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and you use the promo code gold digger. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use the promo code gold digger at checkout for your free account or for 50% off your premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with the promo code gold digger. I want to know from your perspective what the pandemic was like, because I mean, that was a really challenging year for a lot of people, but it it really changed a lot of your social life and just your approach. How was 2020 for you? Well, it seems we had to hunker down. Everybody was pretty much stay at home and uh, be careful because uh, it was such a 
different experience dealing with the virus the way it was. And now we are blessed because we've had both of the shots now. And uh, I think things are on the mend. And I think uh, things are starting to open up now more so we can uh, do more with family. And uh, I think that's a good part. Yeah. Grandma, was it different for you or... No, you you like being at home. Go with the flow. Yeah, go with the flow. What about you, Grandpa? It kind of changed a lot for you. Well, in a way it did because uh, after I lost my wife, I was kind of used to being alone. Mm -hmm. And I would go every week and get some groceries. Well, then after when this pandemic started, I changed my from getting a groceries once a week to once every other week. I would buy enough to last me. And so I was used to being alone, but it's still boring. You know, I'd be times I want to be able to go out and do things, and I do like to travel. And uh, last year, I had made my went to, out to Arizona by myself. I had a good time, and I do like to drive. So, not being able to go anywhere, if you went for a ride, you couldn't go anywhere and have a cup of coffee or anything because all restaurants and cafes and that were closed. So that's that part was kind of lonely. And then in the winter time, there's not much you can do outside because it's so cold. You know. But uh, now that spring is coming and, and I enjoy being outside and putzing in the yard and putzing with my car and, and things like that. So, yeah, I, I just think, too, you know, for a lot of people just I mean, our lives were flipped upside down, you know, in a matter of days and not getting to spend a lot of time with you. That's why being with you right now is so special because we didn't really get to spend a lot of time together last year. So it feels extra special. I think it makes us appreciate things more. Right. So I want to know, tell us the secret, if there is one, to a happy marriage, because all of my grandparents were in very long marriages. So give us give us the scoop, Grandpa. Well, I think one of the greatest things is have a good fellowship with your family and uh, your wife and with your wife <laughs> <laughs> and keep in contact with your children, uh, call them every now and then and appreciate them uh, as they're growing up and pretty soon you got grandchildren and then you got great grandchildren so when there's four generations that's a true blessing and the uh, the kids have been so loyal to us and and uh, we are so thankful that we are able as we are still in good health that we can uh, do the things that we're doing at our age which is really good so we are thankful for that grandma what's your secret to a happy marriage Stand your ground. Ooh, get closer to the mic. You got to say that, Grandma. <laughs> just stand your ground. And if there's something that's bugging you, but just get, you know, really be honest about it and try to solve it or something like that. And after a while, you just get so used to each other that you just know you love them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think Grandma Pat would say to this? I think she'd have a spicy answer to it. Yeah, she would. Her and I got along very well. We were married for almost 59 years when she passed. And uh, we both liked to travel. We did a lot of things together as a husband and wife. And uh, I don't know, she, of course, my wife had her, her opinions on things. And sometimes it didn't <laughs> always agree with me. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Grandma's giving the thumbs up over here. <laughs> but uh, no, she, uh, we got along well, like I said, almost 59 years of marriage. So, you know, everybody, I don't care who they are. They got to admit there's times where you, you have a rocky relationship, you know, uh, nothing major, but, you know, you, you got to give a little bit. And sometimes neither one of us were willing to give and, and that. But overall, we, we had a very good marriage. Yeah. Yeah. I think grandma would say the secret to a happy marriage is that I'm right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so I want to know, tell me like about one of your favorite memories. So I'm guessing grandma, I think maybe one of yours would be your trip around the world. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? In 1976, our daughter was getting married and we were sending our son who was in Paul the money to come home to go to the wedding. And he, he said, no, he said, I'd like to go. But he said, I'd rather that you would come and visit me in Nepal. So we went to the travel agency and they looked and they said, well, that's halfway around the world. And then Phyllis said, well, let's go all the way around the world. So we did and we stopped in many different places. And I've got a journal that I had done. And the, it opened our eyes to the poverty in some of the places and the diverse of different 
nationalities and stuff like that. So it it was uh, one thing I would cherish forever. Mm, I love that. And you were on the road for how many days? Well, we spent 26 days. We flew from Duluth to Minneapolis to New York to London. We saw the changing of the guard and Buckingham Palace. And from London, we flew to Frankfurt, Germany. And from there, we flew to Tehran, Iran. And from there to Delhi, India. And then a short trip from there to Kathmandu in Nepal, where, where our son Dave was. He met us at the airport. Then we walked in the Himalayas after we had a scary bus ride and a scary plane ride. We uh, walked for three days in the Himalayas, and we were above the clouds when we woke up in the morning. We were that high on our trail. And after we left Nepal, then we flew to Bangkok, Thailand. And from there, we went to Hong Kong, China. We were in the province of Kowloon. And we spent three days there. And then from there, we went to Tokyo, Japan. We spent one day there. And then we flew from Tokyo to Guam, where my niece Louise, that's Henry's daughter, has been teaching for over 40 years and a resident of Guam. And then from there, we flew to Hawaii. And from Hawaii, we flew to Los Angeles. And from Los Angeles, we flew back to Minneapolis and to Duluth, 26 wow. days around the world, which is quite a, quite an achievement that we did that time. So that was in 76, October of 76. So Wow. That was really a good trip. Yeah. Grandpa, do you have a favorite memory or something you think about often? Well, there's one thing that I always wanted to be able to see one of my children born. Mm. And during that period of time, we weren't allowed in the delivery room. And uh, so uh, that's one thing I did miss. I always wanted to see one of my children being born. And, and at that time, they didn't allow that. They didn't allow any, anybody other than the mother in the delivery room. But uh, so that's the only thing I, I regret that I couldn't have seen one of my children born. Yeah. But uh, Which is so crazy because then by the time I was born, both of my grandmothers were in the room, which is, so it's just interesting generationally how much has changed because then by the time Conley was born, my mom and sister were in the room and Drew and, you know, it's, it's just interesting. But yeah, that is, I mean, things were just so very different, which is kind of, I mean, it's just wild to see what you've seen in your lifetime. Yeah. Grandpa, is there anything that you would like to bestow upon us of something that you've seen in your lifetime that you wish our generation understood better? I've always had a little part in uh, humor. And that's kind of interesting, too. And uh, I think that's OK in life to have a little a little bit of humor as we go along. And uh, maybe kinda, you should tell some jokes. Well, that that's kind of interesting because. Uh, you know, I got a comb for my birthday, and, you know, I don't want to part with it. So <laughs> that, that's a good sign right there. So we'll, we'll let it go at that. Oh, Grandma, is there anything that you've learned or that you've seen in your life that you wish that people my age understood more? I think maybe the ability to do what they can do, and if they have something that they'd like to do, to do it and to do it well and not to be, have expectations that the world's going to hand you a living. And I think that by doing something that you like to do or to other people, you'll grow. Yeah, that's beautiful. What about you, Grandpa? Well, during the period of time, I was electrician at, for U.S. Steel at the steel mill in Duluth. And the kids nowadays just don't realize how tough times were uh, uh, at the different times, I'm trying to raise a family. And at the time, we, I was only working four days a week. And I would go f- get knocked down from my position to maybe electrician helper or something. And and the money wasn't always there, but we made do. I did work a few side jobs. But other than that, I don't think the kids nowadays really have it tough to where they really truly understand what, what hard times are. Yeah. And my wife and I went through hard times and we got through it. And, and we had a good life, and I, we raised uh, five wonderful sons, and I'm happy about that. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, so if you think of grandpa Sulo, so my daughter's two, then I'm 32, my mom's 62 and you're 92. So there's a lot of 30 year gaps there. So it's pretty incredible when you think about it. Yep. One of my greatest achievements was uh, way back in uh, 1981 when I was asked to go to uh, Colorado in to assist in the startup of a big Conoco refinery after they had had a big explosion and spent a lot of money building it up. And, and I was working in Renshaw at the time. And anyway, I worked with some of the top engineers as we started up that refinery. And it took us 44 days to get everything back into place like it's supposed to be and uh, back into storage. And so that was quite an achievement at that time. Uh, and then I spent four and a half years in Denver until I retired from the Billings Refinery in 1987, where I, where I uh, installed new instrumentation for 10 weeks there. So when you were in Denver, they sent me a ticket so I could come on. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That well, was nice. Yeah. Okay. So here, I'll put this really close to you and then you can just lean towards it. Okay. So one thing I think about often, and I think you all have already started is an amazing legacy. So when you think of the word legacy, you know, what are people going to remember about you? What do you want people to remember about you? Because I think you all have amazing legacies. Grandpa, what do you think of when you hear the word legacy? Well, legacy is uh, pretty important. The main thing is to have good uh, continuity with your family and uh, show them that you care and you love them and... uh, you get a lot of returns back and we are so blessed with that. So Mm -hmm. we can give thanks. What about you, grandpa? Well, through the years I've been involved in different things. I, uh, I was involved with scouting when, when my boys were younger, after I retired and I got involved at Qantas, the volunteer for different things. And, uh, one of our big accomplishments was the fact that we would deliver whole meals for Thanksgiving and Christmas time to some of the needy people. We we didn't have any ideas to where the meals were going to go or who received them, but we left that up to somebody else. And we delivered all these meals, and uh, our Qantas group paid for it, and, and they were complete meals. Uh, like at Thanksgiving, there would be a, a turkey in there. There would be pumpkin pies. There would be potatoes, milk, all different kinds of things that would make a complete Thanksgiving dinner. And we did that at both Thanksgiving and Christmas. And of course, at Christmas time, it'd be a tur- not a turkey, but a ham. And so, but anyways, it was all complete meals and all the people had to do was just cook it up for themselves. But just to, for them to remember that I was involved in other stuff than for myself and for my family, it was in friends and people I didn't even know that we deliver stuff too, so. That's wonderful. So when you look at your grandchildren these days, what do you think? I mean, we have some interesting jobs. We do unique things. We, you know, have kind of created our own paths through entrepreneurship. What do you think about entrepreneurship? Well, Jenna, I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head saying that because you've really done an outstanding job. And so has Joe and so has... uh, Kate and all of our grandkids, Mandy's family and uh, Brandon's family. You all have beautiful homes. You have nice families. You're all industrious. And that's really a true blessing to grandparents at this point in time. Grandma, what do you think about my career? I think she's amazing. (laughs) Grandpa, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you, I... I've got five sons, and every one of them is involved in something else. Uh, they, uh, there's not one of my sons that does the same thing as another one. Yeah. They all uh, have done different things in their life, and uh, they've raised nice families. And I'm really happy about that, that their families have turned out so nice, and my children turned out so good. And I, I don't think a father could be any prouder than I am of my children and grandchildren and that. So that's, that's about it. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Do you have a good joke to leave us with grandpa? A good joke. Well, it's a, just about time for spring now. So 
do you know how they get the water in, into watermelons? Well, it's simple. You plant them in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma, do you have a favorite verse or quote or scripture or anything that you like to think of often? Yes, Jesus loves me. There you, oh, tell me that story about when you heard that you song for the, the first time. Tracks. Oh, my mom died when I was five and my grandma lived next door and she was pretty crippled up and stuff. And, and we lived in a tar paper house. And for some reason, I knew that, that there was a church across the railroad tracks and it wasn't far. So I ran across the railroad track. And as I walked into the church, I was five, six years old, they were playing Jesus Loves Me. And so that's one of my favorite hymns. Oh, and when you hear that, didn't you go home and tell your dad that Jesus loves you? Oh, that's sweet. What about you, Grandpa? I really don't have a a favorite expression or anything. Uh, All I can say is just be kind to your friends and neighbors. And and I think I, I have done that through the years. And I think there's a lot of people know that I have done that. And so that's about all I can say. Just don't think of yourself. Think of your friends and neighbors when you, we're doing different things, you know. So, okay. Final question. Let's pretend like this is an audio message that you're leaving for your family so that they can listen to it anytime. So you know, like when we leave voicemails and you can hit play and you just get to hear the voice and stuff. What would you tell your family right now so that they could hit play anytime and hear your voice and your thoughts? Well, one of the greatest things a grandparent can do is uh, keep in touch with your children and your grandchildren and tell them you love them and you wish the best for them. And uh, so they live a good life and uh, enjoy the long longevity that we have. So uh, that's a true blessing. Grandpa, what would you say? You know, I'm so proud of my children and their accomplishments and my grandchildren and their accomplishments that I don't know what really to say. I mean, when you're proud of somebody for doing something you you really enjoy and they enjoy it, what more can a guy say, yeah. you know? I love that. Yeah. I love that. Well, I love you all so very much. This is really fun to interview you. So thank you for sitting down at the microphone thank with me. Thank you for asking. And thank you for spending the night. We had so much fun, didn't we? Oh, this was great. Yeah, this was good. All right. This ends the interview. Any parting words? Grandpa, get it? Your comb joke? (laughs) Well, one of the best things we can do is uh, keep a close contact with our family. And uh, we are so blessed that we can reach out and help anyone that has a a need at any given time. And uh, just show a lot of concern for family because that's a true blessing. Amen. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 